Welcome to Capital View, where we talk about the latest in Illinois state government and politics. I'm Hannah Meisel with NPR Illinois. Joining us this week is John O'Connor, political writer for the AP. Thanks for being here, John. My pleasure, Hannah. And also here is Charlie Wheeler, uh, Professor Emeritus of the Public Affairs Reporting Program at the U University of Illinois Springfield and also longtime State House reporter and observer. Glad you're here, Charlie. Thank you. It's good to be here. Uh, I, you know, we are, we are uh, you know, six weeks out, I think, from a new year. And 2022, you know, we, 2021 was very active. I think 2022 might throw us for another loop uh, as the roller coaster keeps keeps going. Um, you know, I would like to spend a, a couple, yeah, some time up at the top of the show talking about the possible, maybe, uh, end of this six-year saga for uh, the Auditor General, Frank Martino, who was a longtime Democratic legislator uh, and who took the place of his father before him, who was also a longtime Democratic state legislator. Uh, Frank Martino had been embroiled in this years-long investigation since almost the moment he became Auditor General back in early 2016. Uh, John, what was that about? What, what gave rise to this investigation? Well, he uh, was a, um, a series of, uh, I think, first some, some uh, news reports or, or blog reports, and, and finally a, a uh, lawsuit by a constituent um, of uh, Frank Montino's in LaSalle County. Um, and it questioned uh, his expenditures as a campaign committee over 20 years or more. Um, and it, it had to do, there, there, there was a focus on a, on a, a particular uh, service station in Spring Valley, where Martino's from, uh, where there were hundreds of thousands of dollars of expenses, uh, expenditures. Um, and and the, the, the thing that uh, sticks out with me is that, the, that instead of, you know, most of us in our jobs are paid mileage for travel with our personal car and in this case personal cars were being um, the, the owners of those personal cars on campaigns were being reimbursed for oil changes or for uh, full tanks of gas instead of 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 that mileage and there's a question about um, were those all truly campaign expenditures Right. It was uh, over the course of 17 years, starting in 1999, which is the first year that certain campaign committees had to uh, file expenditures electronically. Um, you know, Martino's campaign racked up nearly a quarter million dollars at Happy's Super Service Station in Spring Valley, like you said, his hometown. And, you know, way it caught the eye of this uh, independent group called the Edgar County Watchdogs that have, uh, you know, there's an interesting Tribune article about them from several, several years back, but uh, they identified a lot of red flags, stuff like spending in round hole numbers for vague, um, vague items like campaign spending or gasoline or, you know, a ton of car repairs too. Uh, very curious number of car repairs. Um, and it wasn't just for Frank Montino's personal car. It was uh, the treasurer of the campaign committee and, you know, a lot of associates. Of course, like you said, John, you know, if you work on a campaign or if we work in our jobs, we would often get mileage. But instead, what Montino's committee did was, I guess, run a credit card, run a, um, you know, they had a ledger, an old fashioned kind of line of credit at this uh, service station. And it, they ran up all of this money over, it, it, it just, it caught a lot of red flags. And so, um, like you said, a former constituent of his, after this Edgar County Watchdogs report came out, uh, filed a uh, citizen complaint with the State Board of Elections. And then for the last six years, it's, it's bounced around from the Board of Elections to appellate courts, to back to the Board of Elections, to another appellate court, Supreme Court, uh, where in May, the Supreme Court gave Montino a half win and threw out half the case, but still said, yeah, you know what? 
these, um, you know, you shouldn't have done that. You should have instead done mileage reimbursement, which by the way, is going to be more expensive for the campaign committee. Um, but then almost as soon as, uh, you know, maybe 10 days later when session was wrapping up in May, uh, Democrats pr pushed through this omnibus elections bill that said, you know, actually it's okay to uh, do what Martino did. And the matter went back to the board of elections and Charlie this week, uh, they said, well, he didn't do it knowingly, so we can't do anything really about it, right? Yeah, I, I, I think that was their decision that, yeah, it, it technically, I, I guess to put it, it was kind of in violation of what the law was at the time, but because he didn't do it knowingly, we're not going to punish it for it. And I think uh, one of the points his attorney brought up was it's actually cheaper for the campaign to put us to spend thirty dollars to fill up the gas tank on a car than it is to pay mileage and it's a lot easier in terms of the record keeping now what will happen is going forward because as you say this uh, omnibus election bill passed and the governor signed it and it now i guess legitimatizes the practice that maltino did now in maltino's case uh, it's, it's kind of a moot point in the sense that he no longer has a campaign committee. And as a matter of fact, it was pointed out that one of the stories I read, had he been in, had a, a fine been imposed, it would have been against the campaign committee and not Maltino personally. And the campaign committee disbanded when he became auditor general. So I guess it's, uh, in one sense, it's a tempest in the teapot at this stage. But in another sense, it points out how the, the campaign finance laws are written, and there are a lot of loopholes, a lot of ways around it, a lot of stuff that you can get away with. And I guess in a broader sense, it kind of reflects the legal system in, in general. We try and write these laws to prevent people from doing things, and there's always folks who are going to try and go through, look for a loophole, figure out a way they can get around it. So it's a, like a cat and mouse game. Sure. And, you know, Charlie, you have watched, you watched the, um, you know, you watched the uh, Constitutional Convention in 1970, and you watched the formation of the Board of Elections. Um, you know, I think this case in particular, but other ones that I've seen over the years, and certainly the two of you, we've seen the Board of Elections kind of been hamstrung by their own structure and, you know, possible other elements, uh, you know, short staffing is a complaint I've also heard. Uh, Charlie, do you think that the Board of Elections, you know, you know 50 years on, maybe ought to um, re-examine that structure to, because, you know, another another uh, omnibus elections bill that Democrats had passed during a veto session a few weeks back kind of hamstrings the uh, board's ability even further. Uh, they can no longer levy any sort of fines or do anything punitive for campaign finance violations that were brought to their attention, you know, m from more than a year ago. I mean, is, a, is the board hamstrung? Should it be a lot stronger? Well, the difficulty, in a sense, is because it's evenly divided. Uh, there's four Republicans and four Democrats on the eight-member board. And so in a state as intensely partisan as Illinois, uh, you're not going to find the board taking difficult positions or positions that are going to uh, weigh heavily against one party or the, or the other. So they're, I don't know if, it, if they're hamstrung, but it was intentionally designed that way. So you wouldn't wind up with a situation where one party could dominate the board and use its powers uh, to go after a candidate in the other party or a sitting member in the other party. It's sort of like, a, what would you say, a mutual detente kind of a standoff. It's like the United States and Russia with the nuclear missiles. <laughs> but John, I mean, if you have a board that is structured in such a way that you're going to have a lot of deadlocks over whether to, um, you know, 
punish a political or a, a campaign committee or a candidate for doing something wrong. I mean, do you think that has contributed to our political culture here? This one of lack of trust and you know the lay person saying, well, you know, Illinois is just corrupt. That's how we do things. I think the the greater uh, issue is one that Charlie mentioned that the wheels of justice, how slowly they turn that by the time anyone comes to a resolution, uh, the, the point is moot. In this case, Martino's campaign committee was closed. You and I routinely read um, uh, investigative reports from the numerous uh, inspectors general around and invariably the person is, who was found guilty of some uh, indiscretion uh, has retired. Right. And there's a there. There's no no way to go after that person. There's no way to punish that person. Uh, All and, it ever says is, you know, this person has left state employment, so put a copy in their personnel file. In, in their personnel sure file, that not to be, right, right, and they're not coming back because they've retired early. They've taken another job. They're going to get a second pension. And in this state government, and this is another pet peeve of mine that they not only can cash in all their unused vacation days, but all their unused sick days. You know, like like that's something that they uh, are entitled to. But um, you know, the, the other thing, the other things that raise uh, uh, that that come to mind in, in this case is that you know, on the one hand, I can play both sides here. On the one hand, somebody as smart as Frank Martino and who was in leadership in the House, the Democratic leadership for years and years and years. If you don't know the answer, you certainly have people on Democratic staff who can help you. On the other hand, um, we talked about how convoluted, you know, election law, campaign finance law can be in certain cases. And it gets to be, d does anybody really want to go into politics? Um, I remember uh, Aaron Schock, who was a congressman from Peoria, and he resigned in, in uh, 2015 after he was charged uh, in federal court with uh, violations. One of the things that they found were uh, exorbitant mileage reimbursements to him. Um, never mind the fact that we keep getting a, our congressional districts keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and it takes like a day and a half from for a congressperson to get from one end of his or her district to the other. But I remember asking Darren Darren LaHood, who was appointed to um, take uh, Shock's place, is is it is it too complicated? You know, can can people? You know, of course, he said no. You know, there you, you can follow the rules. It's easy to follow the rules, but it 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 not only I, disillusions voters about all these people don't know what they're doing or they're, they're all crooks, but it, it, I think it discourages people from stepping up and running. And I would, I, I would put in here though, lest we leave the long impression that the state board is not the principal uh, enforcer of campaign finance laws and corruption laws. As a matter of fact, the U S attorneys, do a pretty good job of catching up on this kind of stuff. So it's not that if somebody gets away with, uh, what would you say, cheating on their reporting, that they're not gonna be investigated by the feds and wind up paying the price. I mean, you look at the record of the people who've been convicted just in the last few years, and the people who are still under fire. And in my mind, the main purpose of the Board of Elections is to keep track of stuff, keep track of campaign finance, keep track of who's running. And I think they do a pretty good job in that sense, that the staff there is very, very helpful in getting out the campaign numbers. I know it was just getting off the ground when, when I was still a reporter, and it used to be very laborious. You would have to go to the office, and you have to sit there with these paper, sheets of paper going through, adding this stuff up. Now it's all online. And what it used to take me three days, you can do now in almost 20 minutes. <laughs> so I give kudos for having one of the best campaign finance reporting operations in, in the country. Now, whether people cheat on what they put in there, that's a different story. Uh, I'd like to move on to another elections-related development. Uh, this week, Governor J.B. Pritzker signed 
uh, like I mentioned earlier, another omnibus elections bill. Democrats pushed through the legislature during veto session. This one, uh, it wasn't the purported main purpose, but uh, talked into it. It bans so-called dark money in judicial elections. Um, first of all, Charlie, briefly, what is dark money? Basically, it's it's money that's contributed to a candidate that the source of which does not have to be disclosed. And there's uh, a series of like shell corporations, if you will, that are set up with innocuous sounding names. And so I get a thousand dollars from the Committee for Good Government. Well, who who gave the, the money to the Committee for Good Government? I have no clue, uh, in theory, and I certainly don't have to report it. The Committee for Good Government doesn't have to report it, and so that's what dark money is. It's money where you don't know the source that is providing these funds, and so therefore you can't assess whether or not this money is going to influence the vote of the person who's receiving it. Sure, and it's you know it's nonprofits uh, set up as social welfare organizations, five hundred one c fours, five hundred one c fives, which are uh, you. Unions, maybe, uh, and trade organizations, which I think are 501c6s. And uh, those are, you know, after Citizens United, that landmark U.S. Supreme Court case in 2010, we saw the explosion of the so-called dark money. Although it was interesting, I was, uh, at least in federal elections, that explosion has calmed down. Maybe folks have realized maybe they're not getting the ROA that they thought they might be. But, you know, John, either way, you know, in state, a lot of academics, a lot of um, folks in the legal community, especially, have been worried about the effects of dark money on judicial races, which, of course, are all states. Uh, and so that would exclude that uh, trend that I just mentioned of it, uh, dark money decreasing in federal elections. Um, other, you know, a handful of other states have um, imposed laws or other regulations that. Uh, get around this by saying, um, you know, you can't, we'll have to see your donors to, you know, for you to accept dark money. And instead, Illinois is doing a slightly different attack and we're saying, we're banning dark money unless, uh, you know, unless you have a 501c whatever that does disclose this money, which sometimes happens. But John, I mean, is this something you think, um, has been a long time coming. Do you think that Illinois doing this will have a domino effect or do you feel like it'll be a uh, challenge in the courts and ultimately struck down? The latter really, I, I, I'm not, uh, uh, this is certainly not my area of expertise. Um, uh, as you pointed out in your article this weekend of the, this becoming, um, although it's you know not as prevalent in the federal elections, it's, it's um, a growing concern with state elections and particularly judicial elections and uh, you know you can start you can start from the very beginning about the, the the question about whether we should be electing judges but um uh i i you know i i don't understand why if if i contribute money to a political cause or campaign that i shouldn't have to disclose who i am um but on the other hand uh it it, it does seem as if you know, an argument could be made in court that that it is some sort of violation, some sort of First Amendment violation, to to have to disclose that. And under, and under this or, law, that, or, or I should say, or I should say, to to ban contributions from people who don't disclose their names. Mm -hmm. And and this law also would prohibit people uh, from taking money from out of state donors. That's right. To, or for judicial, judicial campaigns, they would not be allowed to accept contributions from any out-of-state source or any person or entity that does not disclose the identity of those making the contribution, according to the law, unless it's a contribution of less than $1,000. So I suppose you could go out there and get $990 from a bunch of people. Sure, sure, you know, sure. Somebody who's, who's a big money guy and wants to put it in, he, him, his wife, all his kids, his cousins, his uncles, his aunts, his mom and dad, all his relatives. He could just um, hand him the money and Char it Charlie's in their building name. a campaign committee here. Charlie's gonna run here. He's gonna. Um, you know, Republicans uh, voted against this elections bill. 
um, you know, for a variety of reasons. But, uh, you know, the cynical, uh, you know, comment that Republican Representative Ryan Spain of Peoria had was that this is another way of uh, Democrats changing the playing field because they don't like how the outcome went, especially after last year's very contentious um, retention race for uh, Tom Kilbride, who was, uh, you know, elected as a Democrat to the court in the year 2000. And uh, he was the first sitting justice in state history to lose that race. Uh, Charlie, I mean, Dark Money had somewhat of a role in that race, although, uh, it's negligible, uh, well, maybe that's not the right word. Um, we knew most of where the donors were. There are people like Ken Griffin and Dick Bulein who are out there and want, you know, they're very public with wanting to make a more conservative world in their image. But I mean, you know, talk us through what happened last year and then how, you know, the effects that it'll have in this coming year when we have not just, um, not just that uh, empty, well, not empty, not just that Tom Kilbride uh, seat up for election, but also two judges running for retention and then one other judge running for election. What's at stake? Well, it, there's sort of an irony because, as a matter of fact, uh, dark money didn't really play that big a role. I don't believe in Kilbride's losing because uh, Griffin didn't hide the fact that he gave four and a half million dollars to this uh, Citizens for Judicial Fairness, this, this super PAC that spent a ton to oppose the retention of, of Tom Kilbride. Uh, and Kilbride got backing from the Democratic Party, Mike Madigan, the, its chair then, and various, uh, trial lawyer groups and that's a kind of a an interesting issue in terms of how the amount of money spent to elect judges has has just skyrocketed over years when Kilbride first ran and this was in 2000 it was a Republican seat on the court and the expectation was that the Republican would win and the Republican candidate was a guy named Carl Hawkinson a state senator and Madigan put a lot of money into Kilbride's race. They spent 1.4 million between the two of them and Kilbride won. 10 years later, the tort reform people came after Kilbride uh, and he wound up getting retained, but the amount of money spent was 3.4 million, which was an all time record. Then of course, the last time, just last year, he lost his retention and $11.7 million was spent on retention, which is the most ever spent on a judicial issue in Illinois so far, and I think in the nation. And, and we've seen this just escalating in terms of money coming in. And it's basically people trying to elect a judge who already agrees with their positions or get rid of a judge who doesn't. And it'll be interesting to see what happens because the Democrats, for the first time in almost 60 years, uh, redistributed the Supreme Court. And so they basically made an open seat around the collar counties around Chicago, which stands a good chance of electing a Democrat, which would give them, uh, retain their four to three partisan edge on the court. And the district that used to be um, Kilbrides has been reconfigured. And so now we have a, a new third district without an incumbent in it. We have the second district that's around Chicago and the suburbs. And then the two other districts expanded geographically. They're basically the top half of the state and the bottom half of the state. And part of it is the, the, the Democrats argued that, well, the, the population variances are so great among the, among the districts. But in a way, the 
issue of representation doesn't involve the old one person, one vote standard because judges don't represent anybody. They're elected to apply the constitution and the law to the cases before them. Mm -hmm. They're not supposed to reflect the, the views of their constituency. Well, I wish we had an hour more of uh, this program. I, there's so much to discuss, uh, and I'm sure we will on future episodes. Uh, but for now, I'd like to thank our guests, John O'Connor, Charlie Wheeler. I'm Hannah Meisel, and we'll catch you again next time after the Thanksgiving holiday on Capitol View.